Hi, my name is Ari Horie, founder and CEO of Learn Startup Lab. Thank you very much for joining us for Bill Levin's uh, webinar today. Today, uh, we have the privilege to have him at Learn Startup Lab. Some of you might not know who we are. Uh, we're located in Silicon Valley, and we run a Women Focus Accelerator. And it is a 12 months program, but the key part that is really exciting is having all selected top female entrepreneurs together. They live in this amazing estate-like house for two weeks. And not only house is great, but really the people who come here and truly committed to supporting female entrepreneurs. So some are uh, angel investor and they might be interested in investing um, and the VCs who wants to contribute and other expert and influencer who's really excited about uh, what we do and are excited about you and female entrepreneur. And Phil Levin has been our support supporter for a long time. And um, you know, when I meet him, we always talk about how much he cares about it, how much we should do something. He specifically talk about we should be committing, investing a certain amount of the money, um, expect women to have a return, and in and, and the way that we can support, um, really show the world. Um, so he's a true champion. And so we're really honored to have him. Uh, I know you're eager to see him. He just got caught in this wonderful San Francisco traffic. So uh, he is a little bit behind. Uh, meantime, I would like to give you um, some of the taste of Women Startup Lab. We've been operating here about four years and we have graduated 100 awesome female entrepreneurs. Uh, four or five of them have exit. Um, and if we name them, you might know, oh, I know some of them. One's Elisa Kafer, who had an AI startup, uh, exited to IBM. Also, uh, Monique Iki, who had uh, Swing by Swing. Uh, she had the largest golf uh, user in the world and it was bought by a media company. And also um, Jackie Von Garden. She is the founder of Bowsetter. Uh, she's been, uh, she, she has gone through our, our program back in 2014, and now she has raised uh, 17 plus um, million dollars and they're doing great work. Woohoo, right? <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, while I, I spoke about that, there is a, um, people like you and there is a 11 entrepreneurs here are going through the program. So while we're waiting, um, I thought i um, give you a quick uh, share and shout from our entrepreneurs. So uh, why don't you come up? And how many of you just come forward? Hey guys. My name is Natasha Che. I'm the founder of Soundwise. We are an audio publishing platform from Washington, D.C. So before I came here to Women's Startup Lab, you know, I looked at a lot of different accelerator and incubator programs, but you know, they all look quite similar. Um, I didn't feel particularly inspired to join any of them, but when I got to know Women's Startup Labs, just Ari's mission and what this organization does, it just feels so inspiring. But still, I had some doubts in my mind when I came here, you know, what, what are these guys doing? You know, Silicon Valley, I'm not familiar with the environment here. But in these two weeks, I've met the most amazing, inspiring women entrepreneurs in my life. And it's such an amazing experience, uh, you know, even, you know, setting aside all the mentors and famous entrepreneurs, and investors that are being invited here to mentor us. Just immersed in this peer group of amazing entrepreneurs is totally life-changing and really lift my vision and perspectives and what I can do with my company to the next level. So I hope if you get a chance to apply to Women's Startup Lab, you will not regret it. <laughs> I'm Joan Clemens, and I'm the CEO and founder of I've Been Vetted, which is a tool and platform using AI and blockchain to reduce both legal and financial costs when you hire the wrong person. Uh, when I found out about Women's Startup Lab, uh, I, I, of course, looked at the uh, web page and I saw information. But you know, when you enter into an accelerator, you're not certain. 
can this accelerator assist my business? You know, I'm in FinTech, so to speak, and a little bit of insurance technology, but the breadth of, of knowledge, and it doesn't really matter what vertical you're in, uh, there is information that can help uh, grow your company exponentially uh, with the serial uh, entrepreneurs, access to, you know, CEOs like Phil Libin and those uh, connected with LinkedIn, not to mention, as uh, Natasha did, the wonderful group of entrepreneurs, fellow entrepreneurs, that you can actually share uh, some of your uh, problems and issues with transparency and the extremely supportive and knowledgeable staff. So I am uh, very honored to participate and I encourage anyone uh, to attempt to uh, uh, actually apply and gain access to this wonderful organization. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Sarita and my company is Trustabit and basically we're blockchain for flight delays. And I met Liz actually at a blockchain conference and uh, she talked to me about this great program, the Women's Startup Lab, and immediately I was on my phone like, oh, this is great, this is me all over it. And the thing that won me about this program is that it takes a founder to raise a founder. And you almost don't know what you don't know. So I came here wanting to know pretty much everything about uh, how to raise funds, what, what's a term sheet, um, how, how does my business model look, how does my pitch sound, is there anything that I need to do to perfect that, and I learned all of that and more being with this great group of women from around the world. And if you ever get the chance to come here, go to the website, fill out that uh, application, you'll never regret it. it Probably is one of the best decisions I've made for my company so far. And I can't wait to get back and talk to my team members about company culture. <laughs> That's like the biggest thing that I've gained from here. So uh, hope to see you guys later. Thank you. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Arielle Jordan. I'm the founder and CEO of Purified. We are disrupting the way digital content is curated and monetized by allowing anyone to create their own content feed on the internet. Uh, when I applied for Women's Startup Lab, I did not think I would get in. I, my confidence level was pretty low. I'm a first-time entrepreneur. I, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. And I didn't tell anybody that I got into the program for two days because I figured they were going to send me an email being like, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. You're not actually in it. Um, and when I got all the, the application materials back of you know, enrolling into the program and it was real, uh, that's when it really sunk in that, that I was really doing something that finally was um, getting recognized. And by a Silicon Valley accelerator, uh, you really can't beat that. So for me, the biggest um, takeaway from this has really just been how Ari has been so amazingly able to kind of identify the, the, the potential in each and every one of the founders here and has been able to really draw out the confidence, um, especially for me, that this is something that I know I can do, I know I can pull off, and with the mentorship and the amazing people that we've been meeting here, uh, investors and seasoned entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, uh, the, the group of women that have come together here, everyone's doing such amazing things, and it has been definitely the best thing that's happened for my company, but certainly for me and my personal growth as a founder. So you should definitely apply. If you get that email, you know, you're doing something great and you really need to come be a part of what's going on here because it will change your life. Hi everybody, I'm Nidhi, I'm from Pavey. Uh, our company focuses on nonprofits. Our goal is that donors want to donate, nonprofits want the money. We make sure the timing right and the donation happens. I found out about this program through a friend who sent me an email that one of the mentors who's going to be here is fantastic at creating pitches. And it's like, if you get a chance to even meet him, you should go and he's going to be at this program. I happened to see the link at the end of the email, just hit apply. And then I got interviewed by the team. The interview went great. I, uh, it seemed like a fantastic group of people to work with. 
but I had a baby about uh, five months ago at that point when I was interviewing. And uh, during my interview with Ari, I remember telling her, this is great, but you know, I have a baby right now, so uh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it. But thank you so much for the opportunity, maybe another time. And she says, well, uh, if your husband gone into a program like this, would you have stayed back and taken care of the kid for two weeks? I'm like, yeah, of course. And she says, why is there a difference? And that got me thinking, right? Like, yes, why is there a difference? Uh, it made me think about all the different uh, ways we think differently, right, in our mind, because we have a bias. Uh, going ahead, she and her team really tried hard to see how they could make my situation work. Uh, they even offered a situation where maybe I could go back home a few days or you know, some days the baby could come and stay here. In the end, it all got figured out and I'm here at this program. It's been so fantastic to hang out with all these lovely women over here learning from each other. Uh, the residential part, uh, I was confused why we'd have to stay here for the two weeks, but now I can see there's just such a big difference. Right? We go through so much in the day. And just being able to get a full night's rest and without your baby waking you up three times a night makes a big difference. And I'm happy we stayed here for the two weeks. Uh, being from Silicon Valley, I always thought that all these people were very accessible and I could go meet them whenever I wanted. But being in a program like this where they come meet us and they're, you know, vested in our uh, success, giving us the time makes such a lot of difference. In it's gotten me more excited about my startup, about what we're trying to do and what we can achieve. So thank you for the startup lab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I promise I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everybody for sharing. Um, Phil's here, he, he just arrived. Um, so let's see. Phil, are you ready? <laughs> He's getting a call. Getting a slipper, picking up his shoes. Um, we also have um, next events coming up uh, March 21st. Yes. Hello, everyone. She, she's the one who's getting email. Yes, I've been emailing you like crazy. March 21st, we have an event at 6 p.m. at the house as well as via webinar. So you can come see the Women's Startup Lab house where everyone's living, where everything's happening. That's Stacy Barriera, and she exited her first company when she was 20 years old. She was funded by Richard Branson, and she is incredibly dynamic and young and crazy and amazing. So come meet her, come hear from her. If you can't be here, join us via webinar. But I hope to see you 6 p.m. Wednesday, March 21st at the house. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> so, Phil. Yay! Hi. So, so uh, Phil asked me to give him a t-shirt so he can wear a start a blog t-shirt that we're actually printing so we can send it to you soon. Um, he's an incredibly accomplished uh, individual, but there's a lot of people who sound successful and he's not. Uh, but he's one of the few that that I have privileged to meet a lot of wonderful people, but he holds a special place in my heart and in many of us because, you know, he just he's so genuine. He know the truth about how hard it is, and he has a gift articulated and connected with the all entrepreneur. And you feel like when he shares something, like, oh, I get it. He was doing that, and I can do it. And all oh, those are tips. So he's very good at explaining things. Your talk is very popular. Um, so besides being an impressive uh, founder and CEO of Evernote previously, um, he's, he also, you also did VC at the General Catalyst. It's mm -hmm. a pretty well-known uh, venture firm. And then you thought about it in another gig, which is uh, Old Turtle, which is AI-driven uh, innovation lab. It's in San Francisco, but also expanded in the global. So his passion is to really enabling um, innovator to uh, create something amazing and contribute to the world. So um, without further ado, thank you for coming here. Thank and, you for uh, Look forward to hearing your talk in the back and everybody's so eager. Besides the web, web people too. So. Hello web people. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, we have, a, we will keep this up to some point and then we will be in the back letting you know. 
than a five minutes, because then your session here at the Women's Store would last much, much longer. Right. And so I'll let you know that. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Is this here? Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, it's really good to, to see everyone again. Uh, I really like coming here. Um, it was a really fun last time. It's very good people. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about the uh, about my journey uh, and take any questions you guys have. Uh, you're very kind with your introduction. I, I don't actually think that I've accomplished all that much, uh, although I, I, I do think it's been, I kind of see it as, as being a pretty good start. So any day now, we'll, we'll, get, to, <laughs> we'll get to make something meaningful. Uh, we're up for a good start. Um, so my name is Phil. I'm a, I'm a programmer originally. Um, started got into computers when I was when I was super young. I grew up. Uh, I was born in, in Russia uh, and then came to uh, came to this country uh, when I was eight years old as a as a refugee from the from the Soviet Union with my parents uh, and grew up mostly in the Bronx in, in New York uh, in a pretty pretty rough neighborhood in the Bronx in the uh, uh, late seventies early mid eighties. Uh, but none of that really mattered because I was, I was the giant nerd that pretty much just stayed inside of my room the whole time and uh, begged my parents to getting me an early computer and then just you know stayed inside and hacked around on the computer and had my very small circle of uh, equally nerdy friends. Um, and started my first company uh, in high school. Um, we were making computers. We would buy computer parts from Taiwan, mail order from these mail order catalogs and we would assemble them, you know, PC phones and sell them to local local businesses. Uh, did that senior year of high school and I and I sold that company. It was the first company and I exited. I sold it for five hundred dollars. Uh, which was uh, you know five hundred big ones. Uh, just five hundred ones. Um, and it was uh, it was cool. It was like as much money as I'd made the previous summer working at Carvel Ice Cream. Uh, it was the, the, the first time that I actually saw like oh, this is like I can, I can make something that doesn't require somebody else giving me a job. Um, worked all through college as a programmer, and then um, was working with a few college friends of mine uh, as a programmer at a company in Boston called ETG, our technology group. Yeah, this would have been in the mid, mid to late nineties. Uh, it was a really unique experience for me. Um, up to that point, I pretty much, I, I was pretty, I think, insufferable. I, I was used to being, to thinking of myself as a, uh, pretty smart. I was kind of used to thinking of myself as, as you know, more or less the smartest person in, in most rooms. Uh, and that was mostly true in high school and in college. Uh, um, and then I got to this place, I got to ATG, and, and, and it was definitely true in like other places I've worked. Like when I was working in big companies, so we thought, yeah, that was the best person here. And then I got to this place, ATG, uh, our technology group, and all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I was barely adequate. Like, the other people there were brilliant. And I had this first experience in my life where I was like, wow, I have to like really work hard to just like just to keep up, just to like just to tread water, because the other programmers and, and designers and engineers were just amazing. Like Richard Kleinman's son was one of my coworkers, uh, and, uh, and there were just people who were who were crazy talented. Uh, and it was really confusing for a while because for the first time in my life I was I had to work really hard to, to keep up. Um, and uh, I realized like, oh, this is kind of the secret of happiness. This is like maybe the way that I should try to structure the rest of my life because uh, it felt so different than like, being in a place where I had to I had to work really hard to keep up and being the most happy people that I ever did before. So I kind of vowed to set up my life to maximize the, the time that I spent being the least interesting person. In, and that's as a philosophy has worked out pretty well. Um, so we were we were at EDG, um, and then decided to start our own company. Uh, me and, and uh, two two friends, Keach and Brandon from college, uh, and we didn't really have uh, we were going to call it Edge of Five because uh, it's hard to come up with good names. Uh, and there was originally five of us, but then two people chickened out. But we already had the URL, so it was checked Edge of Five. Uh, and we didn't really have a mission. Like all the advice I give now to entrepreneurs is, you know, have a mission, know what you're going to do. We didn't, we didn't know any of that. We didn't follow any of our later advice. Um, the reason we wanted to start a company was 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 really kind of a social experiment. Uh, we, the way we were thinking about it was, 
that all of you probably have this experience working in other companies where you know you're sitting at your desk and you kind of think, well, I know what I do, and I'm okay, I'm, you know, I'm decent at it, I know what I do, and uh, uh, you know this woman sitting next to me, okay, I know what she does, and she seems pretty good, and uh, you know and that guy over there seems pretty good, but I don't want to look at anyone for real, but that guy sitting in this over there, like, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> He's kind of an asshole. Why is he here? Like, doesn't everyone else know? Like, when he showed up to interview, didn't, didn't they tell? He's an asshole. Why did they hire him? And so we thought, well, could we make a company and not have any assholes in it? Because it's never been done before, like in industry companies. We thought, well, what if we made our own company and then when people showed up to interview and they turned out to be assholes, we just put like sign here and hire um, So we started a company and, uh, and it turned out you could do that up to about 12 people. We had, we, were, we had a pretty good track record. And that was in 97, um, which was really right at the, at the, at the heart of like the original dot-com um, uh, bubble. So it was pretty easy to, to work. You know, if, you, if you had a computer, you could just show up and just start people just giving money for, for programming. So we did that. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to do. We wound up getting clients. So we were basically became consultants. Uh, and we started building, and we, we wound up building some of the first e-commerce sites. Um, a company called eToys, and there was some stuff we did for Toys R Us, and some stuff we did for Barnes and Noble and Nokia. Um, and uh, we grew to about about twelve or thirteen people over about two years, and um, uh, learned an important lesson: that a it was totally possible to to have a company without any assholes in it, which is great. Um, but two is that consulting sucks. Uh, that was like a really important lesson. It, it's really terrible. Like when people pay you for work, it's just like it's not a good life because you're not building anything of value. You're just getting paid for work. And, and we're getting paid a lot towards the end. But when you're not working, you're not getting paid. You're not building anything. Like there's nothing that's accumulated. You're just you're just working. Um, uh, and and it was, it was difficult. We were working. I mean, no exaggeration. Easily 18 hours a day, so seven days a week. Like back then, people used to smoke. And I totally remember like being at the office at you know 4 a.m. in the winter in Boston with like my co-founders like leaning out of the window, like halfway out of the window of like a fifth-story office building to smoke because like we didn't have time to like go downstairs to smoke. So it was like, it was, like open a window and I would like, kind of be close by just in case I toppled over. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was really hard work, and uh, um, and we didn't get the sense that we were building anything. You know, above and beyond just the hours that we put into it, um, and we uh, um, we wound up doing this one project for Nokia. Uh, we were building the very first online store, uh, and they wanted to use this product called Vignette, the story server that people store, which was one of the first content management systems a big company called Vignette out of Texas. And uh, we begged them not to use it. This is terrible. It's a terrible product. Like, oh, this product doesn't do anything. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. Uh, we were like, it's going to cost you a million dollars for us to build it, but if you want to use it yet, it's going to cost you two million dollars because it's going to take us twice as long than starting from nothing to get the product. It really did nothing other than just like make life hard and cost another million dollars. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, no, we've already made a strategic decision to use it yet, so we have to use it. Fine. So we used it, doubled the price, it's getting paid. And it was hard because it was, it was just not a really good product. So, but we, 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 we made it work. We like actually did some, you know, we made a shopping cart in it, which didn't a big deal back then, and made it all work. And then after the project was over, we were sitting around uh, joking about uh, how much it sucked. Uh, and uh, I was saying, oh, I should just write a letter to Vignette, saying, like, Dear Vignette, just want to know that your product is terrible. And uh, one of our co-founders, uh, actually our first business person, Alex, uh, said, uh, well, why don't you do that? Like, seriously, like, you know, you don't have to be an ass about it, but just write it and give them feedback on the product. I'm like, okay. So I wrote an email saying, hey, we just completed this product for Nokia, and it's really difficult because you know, product made it difficult in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way. Three days later, they were in our office trying to buy our company. So they, they responded saying, oh my God, yeah, that's amazing. Like, we heard that you guys were doing this work. We're really interested. You know, the product like, needs a lot of work. And you know, we think you guys are the right people to do it. So uh, would you be interested in being acquired? We were really interested in being acquired. <laughs> uh, because we were just exhausted after two years of 18 hours a day. So they said, okay, come fly to Austin. And uh, uh, we thought we would buy your company. 
So me and one of my co-founders, Alex, we flew to Austin. We'd never like sold a company before or anything. And I literally had no idea how, how it works. Mm-hmm. Or even like, what, what, what should we get for it? I didn't know. Uh, they didn't mention the price of the phone. And we were on the plane and I remember talking to Alex and I was like, well, he, he, he was my friend with an MBA, so he actually he's some business and stuff. Uh, I said, how much do you think we should, we should ask for? It? And he's like, well, we should, definitely, we should definitely get at least a million dollars, right? Because it's less than a million dollars. Um, you know, we just make enough in revenue where that's only like a couple of years of revenue, even at our profit level. So we should get at least a million dollars. I was like, oh, really? A million dollars. Like, I've never thought of that in my head before. But he's like, yeah, like you, you did some math. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Totally. We will, if they offer less than a million dollars, we're not going to say no. Should we, should we ask for a million dollars? And he's like, no, we should definitely just let them give a price. Uh, because any price that we say is just, we're just setting the floor. So we need to let them set the price. But we need to decide right now that if they say less than a million dollars, we're just going to walk away. Fine. Maybe it should be $2 million. <laughs> what do you think? Can we get $2 million? And it's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe. All right. Well, if they, if they offer less than $1 million, we'll definitely walk away. If they offer like more than two, then we'll accept. Okay. We had no idea. Uh, we show up, we get to the office, and it was literally like a you know, giant conference room, big, like giant old table. Two of us, two of them sitting across the whole table. And they literally did the movie thing with them. We're going to write down the number. That's <laughs> <laughs> so there's a number, pass it to me, and I'm sitting there and I get it. It's like, and it's $25 billion. What? Like, billion? 25 billion. Wow. And I was like, we can't, we can't do it for less than 26. And they're like, fine, 26, but that's it. We're going to negotiate for one deal. So we sold the company, um, and it was it was in nineteen it was it was in January two thousand, which was about twenty minutes before the first dot com bubble burst. Oh, uh, wow. so we were just super lucky. Uh, there was no there was no skip. We just happened to be lucky. Uh, and they gave us half in cash and half in stock. We were a public company already. Their stock over the next two years went from their market cap went from like ten billion to like two hundred million. So they they lost like nine percent. Um, but they give us half cash, but then the cash that we got, we all you know immediately invested in other startups and other massive stuff. So we were like, oh, we're investor geniuses. We can do anything, obviously, we can do everything. And so all of that went to work. Uh, but uh, 25%, and this was actually, I should have taken this as, as a little bit of a red flag about how, bad, how crazy the market was at the time. And they said, well, we have to close this really quickly. We don't have time to do a lot of due diligence. So um, we have to, we're going to take 25% of the total purchase price and we're going to put it in escrow for two years. And if there's any legal claims against you for two years, then we'll take out of the escrow. Otherwise, two years later, we'll get the 25%. And I was operating, so I'm like, bullshit, it's my 25%. I can't just have my 25% of my money for two years. So I guess the way we have to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to get it done. Fine. So uh, two years later, we get out of our lockup. All of the stock we, we got is, is down by 98%, by 99%. So we basically lost everything. All of the cash we got is down probably also 90% because we know they're investing it, like losing it in other stupid ways. So we basically got no money out of it other than this 25%, which was sitting in escrow earning 3% interest every year, actually got paid back to us. And so mm-hmm. at the end, we wound up with a quarter of the value that we thought, but we literally had expected zero at that point because everybody didn't double box. We were like, we are investing geniuses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even that was more than the Um, and it was um, it was an interesting moment because at that point, you know, we'd sold this first company. We sold it for an amount that by today's Silicon Valley standards is pitiful. You know, we sold it for $26 million, which would just seem as like a massive failure for any VC funded company. Actually, the stupidity of that is one of the reasons we started all turtles. Um, but we had no investors. We didn't even know there was such a thing as investors. Like it never occurred to us that other people would like give us money. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just us. And um, none of us had any money. None of us came from families uh, that, that had money. And when we sold the company, I had the realization that, like, I now had more money at my disposal than all of my ancestors combined 
ever had going back to about 100,000 years. Because uh, my family are were uh, musicians or something. Um, and uh, it was a weird, it was like a weird feeling. And, and I knew it, you know, I did the math and I knew it wasn't enough that I would, I would still have to work. You know, it wasn't, I mean, it was young, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that much, but it was life changing. And I, and I knew that even though I would still have to work, I would never again in my life have to work on anything I didn't want to work on. And that was like, that was, that was awesome. That was the, that was the real change. That was the real freedom. It was like, from now on, I never have to do anything that I don't really want to do. Um, and when I'm now on the other side of the table in similar situations, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs and maybe they have an offer and maybe it's only a few million dollars, or it's not high or something, and they're only getting pressure from VCs and not being able to do it or not to do it or whatever. Like the way I kind of think about it is, like, what is this going to let you do for the rest of your life? Like, what is the, like, how does this transform every other decision you're going to make because you know you have the confidence, or even if you're not completely independently wealthy, you at least have enough where you never have to have a shitty job ever. It's, it's, it's kind of great. Anyway, but we learned uh, a bunch of important lessons from that company. Uh, one that consultants suck. One that giving like actual feedback in a non assholey way is a, you know, it's a good way to do, do business. Uh, one is that it's it's the culture experiment worked out, and uh, we got out of our, our two year lockup. And we said, okay, well, let's do it again. Um, and it was so we started our second company, same team, a little bit bigger. Uh, and it was on October 11, 2001, so it was exactly a month after September 11. Um, and uh, back then, those of you guys who are old enough to remember, I think everyone wanted to do something meaningful. Like everyone kind of felt a month after September 11, like we need to do something more meaningful. Like the stuff we were working on before, what well, we were doing, you know, e-commerce, we were letting people buy CDs online. It just seems, it seemed frivolous, right? It seemed stupid. A month after September 11, we were like, we got to do something more real. Um, so we started, but we also knew that we didn't want to be consultants again. We like needed to make a profit because we wanted to actually make some residual value. So we started a company called Core Street, which is an MIT spin out, and uh, um, uh, we partnered up. Our, one of my co-founders was a brilliant professor out of MIT, Sylvia Macaulay, and uh, he had invented all this new type of math. Uh, and so we started this company doing uh, cryptography and security for, for large governments. We basically were going to change the way that security works in the world. And we sold it to, uh, we sold the products to uh, uh, government organizations, militaries, uh, big banks, and large enterprise sales. Um, and so we ran that company for seven, six or seven years, uh, and then also wound up selling, selling that company as well. Um, and uh, the the main lesson to learn there is like, yeah, the no assholes rule still still worked, still applied. Uh, we got larger, we got from, I think, at, a, at our height, we were like 50 people maybe. Uh, so we had been grandfathered in, but no, no new assholes after after the, the initial batch, uh, and that worked okay. Um, and making a product was better than consulting. But, you know, we weren't the customer. We were making something. So in our first company, we were making something for retailers, and so we had to keep thinking. Every day, we would wake up thinking, like, well, what does is, what is Nokia want? What does a retail want? In the second company, we were making products, but it was products for governments and banks. And so we had to like, keep thinking, like, well, what, is, what does the government want? Question. Uh, you know, what, is, what do the big banks want? And um, I, we just got really tired of that. We just got really sick of it. So after we sold that company, actually a little bit before, we were raised to be, so I replaced myself as a CEO right before we sold. Um, uh, and decided to make a new one, we said, uh, okay, this time around, third time around, we don't care what the market wants. We don't care what the customers want. We're sick of thinking about the customers. Uh, <laughs> who the hell are those guys anyway? Uh, yeah. Let's just make something that we want. So let's make an experiment to see something. If we, we're the customer. Um, we can make it for, for what we want instead. Uh, and we had a we had a, a, a logic for doing this because uh, this was 2007, um, so it was actually exactly 10 years after after we started our first company. We were, we were starting our third, um, and we kind of thought, well, you know, world's changing. There's a lot more like social media and things like that. And um, if we make something that's really great, that's high quality, it'll it'll get out there faster. We can really want to talk about it, so people will know about it. So all we have to do is make something really great. Whereas before, like that was never true. Like when we were making. Yeah, when we were making our first company in 97, like, yeah, you could make something great, but most of the work was still in, like, how do you tell people about it? It was still in the marketing and the distribution and logistics. Whereas 10 years later, those things felt a lot less important because 
the world was just became much more connected at that point. So if you made something great, everyone would know about it. It doesn't really matter how much you spent on, on those other things. Um, and we thought, okay, well, if, no, it takes like 10,000 iterations to, to make a really great product. Uh, or I don't know, a thousand or something. Um, and when we were doing stuff for, for governments and big banks, um, you know, each iteration would take like 18 months because, you know, they would release a version and it would like sell a pilot to the Department of Energy and then, you know, they would go through some process and a year later we would get some feedback and then we would like try to make a new version. So it would take you know, over a year to like improve the product each time. And so if you need 10,000 iterations and each one takes you, you know, 18 months, like you don't have 18,000 years to, 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 to devote to this. So we thought if we make the product for ourselves, we're the customer and we're honest about it, then maybe we can iterate every like 40 minutes because we, we can just be making changes all the time and we can evaluate it ourselves. And so we can just get through those 10,000 durations in a reasonable amount of time and actually make a great product. Now, so that was the reason. So we weren't, it wasn't like a general feel good, oh, we want to follow our dreams. We just said it very practically, like, right? how do we get far more iterations packed into a few years than we were able to in our previous company? Oh, the way to do that is to make stuff for ourselves because then we can have the feedback be, be, uh, be much better. Uh, so we thought, okay, that's worth trying. Uh, what should we make? So we got to make something we love. So we sat around, we went to founders, and we basically remember this meeting uh, in uh, 2007. And uh, we just made a list of all the stuff we wanted, we loved, that we wanted to work on. So I, I really like video games. Well, with it. Then, so I said, well, why don't we make a video game? And then we kind of said, well, we don't really know much about making video games. We're just video game players, but also like, I already have a big stack of video games on my desk that I haven't had time to play. There's already a lot of really good video games. I feel like the world doesn't need another video game. So what, what else do we really like? We kind of said, well, you know, it's 2007, and uh, we really like some of this new social media stuff. Maybe we should make a social media network. And I said, yeah, but there's already MySpace, and no one can beat MySpace. We're, we're, we're too late you know, for that, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't bother making another, another social media. Network. Um, then we, so we went down the list, and we got to, well, what about, like, what about productivity? Like, we all want to be more productive, feel smarter. We're all kind of like you know, life hackers. Uh, and the current generation of productivity tools, even back then, were 20 years old. It was like Microsoft Office it hadn't changed in mm -hmm. 20 years, even, even back then. And you couldn't use it on these new you know, smartphones that people were starting to carry around. Or you kind of thought, why don't we make like a new generation of productivity? Like, why don't we redefine what it means? Like, what are the essential productivity tools? Because 20 years ago, it was you know a slide presenter and a word processor and a spreadsheet and a database. I'm like, what the hell's a database? Mm -hmm. Some of these concepts don't even really make sense anymore. And uh, you know, people are moving away from their PCs anyway. So why don't we just like, why don't we make like the new definition of what it means to be productive? Why don't we make like, like the, we, we thought of it as an external brain, like a cognitive prosthesis, like something that makes you smarter. Um, and we said, yeah, okay, that, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Uh, so we, we started working on it. We were going to call it Ring. Uh, sorry. No, we were going to call it Ribbon. Uh, ribbon, like, uh, like tie a ribbon around your finger, if you remember. Um, and started doing the due diligence on that. And then I was introduced to this guy in California, this, this crazy, brilliant uh, Russian-American like, inventor and entrepreneur named Stefan Hachigov. And he had a team in, we were in Boston, he was in California, he was actually really close to here. Um, and he had a team working at a very similar vision. Uh, and this was actually the team that Apple brought over from Russia in like the late 80s to make the Apple Mutant. No one probably remembers the Apple Newton, but it was like the first tablet. It's like way ahead of its time. Brilliant team of scientists came over to do that. And they were working on this idea of like infinite memory and helping people remember everything. And so I, I flew to California, uh, met Stefan at this really terrible sushi restaurant in, uh, in Sunnyvale. Um, and uh, we decided, you know, instead of competing, let's just, let's just join forces so right from the beginning and just make something together. So he already had a company called Evernote. It was a different corporate entity. It was spelled differently. And uh, I moved my team here. We made, we kind of redid the company, we recapitalized it, and called it Evernote. Uh, and uh, we launched the first version of the product in early 2008. About, uh, actually, just about 10 years ago. It was the 10 year anniversary of uh, last month. Um, and the whole point of it was it was the first time that we actually had like a product vision. We knew what we wanted to do, we knew why we wanted to do it, how we wanted to do it. We took some bets on, on mobile um, and uh, got really lucky, and, and, and that worked. 
work well. Um, we were we were fundraising at the worst possible time, so we really needed to raise money in uh, 2008, right at the height of the of the, of the financial collapse this last time. Um, and we also made we made a series of really bad mistakes uh, early on. We got a terrible startup pitch. No no Silicon Valley investors gave us money. We talked to all of them. Um, our first investors were like like Canadian, like Alberta oil barons <laughs> and like and, and Japanese telecom people and like Russian bankers. And it was like, it was a very eclectic mix of people. I had to go, I literally forever know it, had to go to Kazan to raise money. Kazan is in Tartar Sam, uh, which, is, which is a real place. It's where Tartar sauce comes from. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was raising money in Kazan. Uh, so I really have like very little sympathy when like, you know, why combinators not just complain about how like, oh, we've already had 20 VC meetings and we haven't had a term trade on Because on. We did get money from them, so that's a trouble. Um, and, uh, but the big mistake we made was that our, our we, you know, we merged these two teams. And so we had a very, we didn't have a cookie cutter corporate structure. We, we didn't just have, you know, like one team with a simple cap table and a safe note. You know, we, just, we had like two teams with all sorts of conflicting. It was just a mess. There was no reason to do it. But we definitely didn't do it again. The people were great, but what we should have done is just like started over. We should have just been like, okay, both of us are shutting down our companies. We're just reforming. You know, go from scratch. Just make it really simple because investors hate any sort of complexity. And you have to like prove that you're like before they'll even pay attention. If it's not standard, like they won't even bother trying to understand the structure until it's once they for them to understand the structure. Which you have to like show some traction for. So we, we were really stupid. And, 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 Coming up with a complicated structure that tried to optimize for some of like our internal, you know, problems and divisions versus just thinking about it from an investor point of view, which is just like what the hell is this? Just make it simple. So anyway, because of that and because the timing was bad, it took us a long time. We we self-funded it for a while. We got friends and family and other like some angel investors, um, but um, couldn't get any VCs. And um, uh, at one point, we did get a term sheet. Finally, we needed. It was already a pretty big team because we were able to string it along for, for a while ourselves. So we were already like 25, maybe almost 30 people. And um, uh, we finally got a $10 million term fee uh, from this European investor, so we were set. Uh, but because of the complexity of the legal structure, it, it took us like, more than six months of due diligence to kind of clean everything up. So we worked on it for six months. Couldn't talk to any other investors because we had signed a no shop agreement and a term sheet, which means we were prevented from talking to anybody else. We won't do that anymore. Uh, and um, six months later, we finally did the due diligence, and we, we had the, our, our closing date set. And on the day of closing, 2008, it was the day that uh, the owner brothers uh, went bankrupt, when the market fell by some giant amount. And the investor called up and said, "We just lost 60% of our overall fund value in one day." So we pulled out of the investment. Uh, and uh, I had um, we had three weeks of cash flow uh, at that point, and had had investor conversations in six months. And the world was melting down, like literally, right? everything in the news was how the economy was tanking. Like, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. So I kind of panicked and I decided I called everyone I knew. Uh, no one would be willing to return a phone call at that point. Uh, so I spent a week just like running around trying to like raise money and no work, absolutely no work. And then um, finally, it was two weeks of cash flow from the bank, and I decided I should have company now. Um, and I remember they were sitting at home. Uh, it was 3 a.m. and I finally said, okay, we're done. I close my laptop, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, drive to the office, lay everyone off, shut the company down. Because we only have two weeks of cash. And you can't go to zero because then you know, you're like, I'm going to jail because they haven't paid some bill or something. So <laughs> to at least like reserve two weeks and just like shut it down cleanly. And I said, okay, this, like, this is it. We tried. It's over. You know, they say you learn a lot more from failure. I guess it's about time to learn something. Uh, <laughs> I remember thinking like, oh, this is what it must be like to feel like an adult. <laughs> it, was like, it was the first time I felt like an adult. I was like 35 then. I was like, oh, oh, this sucks. I never want to feel like an adult again. But anyway, I decided to shut the company down. And uh, right before going to bed, 3 a.m., I got an email. And some of you probably heard the story. But I never know. Uh, uh, it was just an email from some random Swedish guy. And he said, hi, I'm a random Swedish guy. And uh, just want you to know I love Evernote. Sir, we just released the product. We almost started. I was like, ah, I've been 
I started using the product for a few months, and this really changed my life. It's made me much more productive, much happier. I feel like all this stuff done that wasn't before. And so it's great. It's changed my life. I just wanted to send you a note to say how happy I was, whatever note. And I felt a little bit better. I'm like, oh, you know, like you make a difference to like one random Swedish guy, and, like you accomplish something. And then he, he went on to to uh, uh, to write. Uh, so I'm just writing to see if you're looking for any investment. <laughs> and I was like, why yes? <laughs> I'm looking for investment. Uh, and then instead of going to bed, I, I, I stayed up. Uh, and 20 minutes later, I was on a Skype call with him. And obviously, you know, we told him the whole situation or whatever. But two weeks after that, he he, he wired us half a million dollars. And he, he sent us half a million dollars. Just this guy who, you know, had sold a company and had some money and was a tech person and uh, just loved the product. And it totally saved us. Like that half a million dollars, we stretched for probably like nine months. We managed to like make it work. Like I stopped paying myself and all that stuff. And um, and at the end of it, we had we already had enough traction where we could actually raise money. Like it, it put us over the edge where we, we had enough stats and found a way. Like we found a way to talk about it. Plus, like I think people were kind of tired of panicking about the stock market. Like it, it, the economy hadn't improved, but it was already old news that everything was like bad. And so like that extra like six to nine months was exactly what it took to like make us fundable. And then after that, it was you know we and we raised I think we raised like fourteen million dollars for in that company. But that first that, that first you know, three million was, was much harder than anything else. Um, so, uh, you know, tons of lessons from Evernote, tons. Um, or more than, you know, more than we have time to, 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 to talk about. Um, but it, it, it went great. Um, and about, uh, well, I don't know, about eight, eight years into it, nine years into it, uh, we were already pretty big. Uh, we were up to, I think like almost 500 people, like 400 something people or something. Um, and uh, I was having dinner with, with, with a friend of mine, um, who's actually with, with Nick Woodman uh, from, uh, from GoPro. Uh, and I remember sitting down at dinner and he said, You feel like so, you know, you, you look kind of tired or something. I'm kind of exhausted. He said, like, Are you still having fun uh, day to day? Are you still having fun? And I went, No, I'm, I'm not. Uh, month to month, I'm having fun. Like when I look back, like what we accomplished every three months, like that, that feels satisfying. But like day to day, not, not fun at all. Kind of sucks. And he's like, yeah. Um, so you never need to be in a position. You should never put yourself in a position anymore where you're not enjoying what you're doing. Because he said you're you know, you're a drink nerd, and if you don't like something, it means that you're not good at it, and you know you're not good at it. Uh, you just don't have the mastery to enjoy it. And the company this way is successful enough where it deserves someone who's going to be actually really good uh, being the CEO. So your only job at this point is to like, find someone who actually is going to be great at this and who will enjoy it every day. And then you can go and do something. Is that, is that your job? Because if you're enjoying it, it means you're good at it and you're contributing to the world. If you're not enjoying it, it means you're not good at it and you're kind of wasting your time. So like, wow, I was more direct and racing feedback than I was, you know, than I expected. Uh, just thought we were going to. You know, that would be together. Uh, but he was right. I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, so I talked to the board, decided, um, you know, at first we, I thought, well, I don't really have a successor, um, but it's time to start thinking about it. Uh, so maybe what we'll do is we'll hire a, a president. So I'll say the CEO, we'll hire a president, uh, we'll let the president uh, kind of run day to day operations for a year or so. And then, you know, if that works out, if, if, if he or she's good enough, then, you know, then I'll step aside as CEO and this person will be the CEO. And I can Folks on product or something. So I started interviewing with the presidents. Kind of became apparent right away that hiring a president is like much harder than hiring a CEO because the people who are impressive enough to run the company but who would settle for the number two position are like pretty much rarer than the people who, you know, are good enough to run the company but who would want to be the CEO. So within like six months, I kind of said, fine, let's just let's just hire someone who's going to be the CEO. And my plan was we hire someone who's going to be the CEO. I become a Executive chairman and, uh, and head of product, and we're going to stick around and do that. And I kind of knew at that point that there was like a 50% chance that wouldn't actually work out because I kind of thought, well, if I'm hiring a CEO, like you really do have to, you know, to make, make the new person in charge. So there's no way to predict whether or not like the chemistry is going to work ahead of time. So we kind of realized that there was a strong chance that, that, that it wouldn't work out and I would just wind up exiting completely, but you know, still felt like the right thing to do. So, so we did that. We found a great. Uh, Guy, uh, Chris O'Neill, at a group of interviewed probably 50 people over, over like a year and a half. Uh, 
And those are like the 50 that actually got to me in the fourth entry. So you know, the top of the funnel was much bigger. Um, made a bunch of mistakes in the process, uh, but finally wound up hiring Chris. Uh, uh, I became the chairman. Uh, I kind of had a product, but then within like within three months, it was just like it was obvious that it just wasn't it wasn't going to work. Um, it was just too weird, like hanging around. It, like it kind of made him unhappy and the new team. It kind of made me unhappy. Uh, so after about a year on the board, um, just said let's just do a let's just do a cleaner separation. So at this point, I have I'm still a large shareholder. I've got a lot of friends there. I'm a big supporter of the company, but I have no operational responsibilities, which felt um, weird. It was a difficult thing. It felt it felt strange. Um, but this is this is definitely one of the lessons that Evernote taught me, uh, and maybe kind of the central one at this point that I that I, I really go to all the time for important decisions. Um, uh, I think as a, as a as a manager, as a CEO, as a leader, whatever, there's one common mistake that I've made over and over and over again in my life that now that I've understood it, I try not to make anymore. I think it's very common. Uh, I think a lot of people conflate um, difficult decisions, uh, meaning decisions where it's hard to know what the right answer is, like you're just not sure what the right answer is, with emotionally unpleasant decisions, where you know what the right answer is, it just sucks. And I think by nature, most people treat those as the same. So they're, they, they're faced with emotional decisions and they, they pretend that it's difficult to know what the right answer is. And they kind of, you know, can't quite decide whatever. And actually, when you look at it that way, the vast majority of decisions that are, that are like hard decisions to make are actually not hard decisions to make. There's some pleasant. But it's actually not that common that you're faced with something where you're like, oh my God, what's the right answer? I mean, that's important. You know, it happens to trivial things all the time, but important things usually make the right answer. So what I've really tried to do is to just separate those things out. So faced with the decision, I'm like, is this, is it actually difficult to know the right answer is, or is it just unpleasant? And if it's the latter, then it doesn't matter. You just make, you just make the decision in the correct way and you deal with the pleasantness. Uh, and that was very much what leading everyone was like, where it was clear to me that it was the, it was the, it was an easy decision. It was the right decision to make. It just sort of sucked emotionally, but uh, whatever. Um, in the end, I think everyone's happier <laughs> if you act that way. So I left Evernote and uh, uh, wasn't I, I, during my last year, year and a half there as I was exiting, I specifically like refused to think about what I would do next because I didn't want to check out early. I didn't want to, as soon as I figured out like, what my next project is, then it's hard to uh, hard to kind of give it my full attention. Uh, but as soon as I left, I started looking around, seeing what, what I wanted to do, and uh, you know a bunch of VCs reached out and said they would kind of want to work at uh, VC, and I, I really didn't have much interest in venture capital. Um, but then I heard from General Catalyst, a uh, big firm here and up in, in Boston and New York. And they said, well, um, you should come, come work for us because we both were a large VC and you can, you can hatch companies. So you can kind of come up with your own ideas, hatch them, kind of start small companies, invest in companies. It's like the best of both worlds. It's this great partnership, it pays a lot. Uh, it was literally like, it was literally too good to be true. Uh, it was just like, so Casey and Arthur didn't seem too good to be true. And I remember, I, you know, my, my father always used to tell me, um, when something seems too good to be true, just don't ask any questions and jump into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I did that, uh, and, uh, and it was great. Um, uh, and um, but about about two years into it, I kind of realized that like what I really wanted to do was the was the starting stuff, and I didn't really want to do the like the chasing deals. Yeah. Like, fundamentally. Like I'm fundamentally not competitive. I don't care about deals. I'm not motivated to like beat anyone else out. I don't want to like. I'm not a social person. I don't like the like the, you know, the social butterfly. Like oh, who's looking at what deal? Like I just don't care about any of that stuff. I'm not pretty good at it. And that was the lesson from Nick too. Is that if I don't if I if I don't like doing something, I should just take that as a signal not to do it. Um, but what I really liked was being doing the early stage. Like, getting stuff started, getting it kind of set up stage. But I didn't want to focus on just one thing. So I started working on what, what became All Turtles inside of General Catalyst. It was originally called Found Robot Company. Uh, and uh, but then kind of realized that you know it became bigger and bigger. It became kind of more and more epic in, in, in ambition and in scope. And we kind of thought, okay, this needs to be its own separate thing. So we started as a separate company in June last year. So we're about eight months, nine months old. Uh, and uh, John Cattles became one of the big investors. We got a bunch of other money uh, and launched it. And uh, what we're doing now at All Turtles is, is uh, basically we're, 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 we're kind of calling bullshit on everything I've done in the past 20 years. Um, 
Group, which is the whole Silicon Valley style model of entrepreneurship of like making companies and kind of saying it doesn't really make sense um, because uh, we do this thing which is uh, uh, which is weird, which is we find really brilliant product founders and we tell them that they have to make little companies first. Like before they get to really try their product idea, they have to, they have to make a little company. Uh, and uh, that doesn't make any sense because making companies super hard. It's all this stuff that you have to do that you can get wrong. Um, and it has nothing to do with actually making a product. But yet we force people to make companies and we teach them all of this stuff. Um, and we're the only industry that does that. Uh, so, for, for example, if you are if you're a musician, right? Imagine that, like, let's just say you're, you know, one of the most talented, naturally gifted musicians alive in the planet today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mozart level genius musician. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you don't have to make a music company, mm -hmm. right? You just play. And the platforms have been created over the past couple of decades, like YouTube, where you're going to reach a billion people just by because you're so talented. You just express that talent. You can exercise it. You can have an impact. If you're one of the most brilliant writers alive today, you don't have to make a writing company. You just write. Platforms have been created. If you're one of the most brilliant filmmakers today, you don't make a film studio. You just like you you want to go to HBO or to Netflix and get your stuff with Amazon and get things made there. But if you're one of the most talented product entrepreneurs, you have to make a company. You have to figure out your foreign and A valuation and, and your CAC to L to E ratio and how to manage your board and how to deal with founders and draw them like why. So we we're making a, an AI uh, studio uh, to work on AI enabled products. But the, when we say studio, we mean like Netflix. So we're basically making Netflix. Like we are Netflix. We, we want to make a place that attracts really talented people in the industry. But it's a very disciplined structure for actually making original product, making it and distributing and doing everything. Um, except instead of TV shows and movies, we make tech products, we make consumer products. And we do it all over the world. So we have uh, part of, the, part of the, the reason we wanted to start this is we believe that uh, real talent, this Mozart level talent, is super rare. Obviously, like by definition, it's super rare, but it's evenly distributed everywhere in the world. And uh, we want to make sure that wherever those really amazing people are, wherever they are in the world, they get to they actually get to like use their talent in a way that has impact on the world. So we started in San Francisco, Tokyo, Paris. Uh, that's where we're now. We're opening up Mexico City. That's our next location. In about a year from now, a little less than a year from now. Uh, and the goal is in the five years to be in the World City is just a new game for the products together. Uh, so that's where we're at today. Uh, so that's a fairly long winded account of everything I've ever done in my life. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening to it. Uh, happy to talk about whatever is interesting to you guys. Thank you. Thank you.